Socialism and Nationalism by James Connolly. In Ireland at the present time, there are at work a variety of agencies seeking to preserve the national sentiment in the hearts of the people. These agencies, whether Irish language movements, literary societies, or commemoration committees, are undoubtedly doing a work of lasting benefit to this country in helping to save from extinction the precious racial and national history, language, and characteristics of our people. Nevertheless, there is danger that by too strict an adherence to their present methods of propaganda and consequent neglect of vital living issues, they may only succeed in stereotyping our historical studies into a worship of the past, or crystallizing nationalism into a tradition, glorious and heroic indeed, but still only a tradition. Now, traditions may, and frequently do, provide materials for a glorious martyrdom and can never be strong enough to ride the storm of a successful revolution. If the national movement of our day is not merely to reenact the old sad tragedies of our past history, it must show itself capable of rising to the exigencies of the moment. It must demonstrate to the people of Ireland that our nationalism is not merely a morbid idealizing of the past, but is also capable of formulating a distinct and definite answer to the problems of the present and a political and economic creed capable of adjustment to the wants of the future. This concrete political and social ideal will best be supplied, I believe, by the frank acceptance on the part of ale earnest nationalists of the republic as their goal. Not a republic as in France, where a capitalist monarchy with an elective head parodies the constitutional abortions of England, and an open alliance with the Muscovite despotism brazenly flaunts its apostasy to the traditions of the revolution. Not a republic as in the United States, where the power of the purse has established a new tyranny under the forms of freedom, where 100 years after the feet of the last British redcoat polluted the streets of Boston, British landlords and financiers impose upon American citizens a servitude compared with which the tax of pre-revolution days was a mere trifle. No, the republic I would wish our fellow countrymen to set before them as their ideal should be of such a character that the mere mention of its name would at all times serve as a beacon light to the oppressed of every land, at all times holding forth promise of freedom and plenteousness as the reward of their efforts on its behalf. To the tenant farmer, ground between landlordism on the one hand and American competition on the other, as between the upper and the nether millstone, to the wage workers in the towns, suffering from the exactions of the slave-driving capitalist, to the agricultural laborer, toiling away his life for a wage barely sufficient to keep body and soul together. In fact, to every one of the toiling millions upon which misery, the outwardly splendid fabric of our modern civilization is reared, the Irish Republic might be made a word to conjure with, a rallying point to the disaffected, a haven for the oppressed, a point of departure for the socialist, enthusiastic in the cause of human freedom. This linking together of our national aspirations with the hopes of the men and women who have raised the standard of revolt against that system of capitalism and landlordism, of which the British Empire is the most aggressive type and resolute defender, should not, in any sense, import an element of discord into the ranks of earnest nationalists, and would serve to place us in touch with fresh reservoirs of moral and physical strength, sufficient to lift the cause of Ireland to a more commanding position than it has occupied since the day of Benburb. It may be pleaded that the ideal of a socialist republic, implying, as it does, a complete political and economic revolution, would be sure to alienate all our middle class and aristocratic supporters, who would dread the loss of their property and privileges. What does this objection mean? That we must conciliate the privileged classes in Ireland? But you can only disarm their hostility by assuring them that in a free Ireland, their privileges will not be interfered with. That is to say, you must guarantee that when Ireland is free of foreign domination, the green-coated Irish soldiers will guard the fraudulent gains of capitalist and landlord from the thin hands of the poor, just as remorselessly and just as effectually as the scarlet-coated emissaries of England do today.
On no other basis will the classes unite with you. Do you expect the masses to fight for this ideal? When you talk of freeing Ireland, do you only mean the chemical elements which compose the soil of Ireland? Or is it the Irish people you mean? If the latter, from what do you propose to free them from the rule of England? But all systems of political administration or governmental machinery are but the reflex of the economic forms which underlie them. English rule in England is but the symbol of the fact that English conquerors in the past forced upon this country a property system founded upon spoliation, fraud, and murder, that, as the present-day exercise of the rights of property, so originated involves the continual practice of legalized spoliation and fraud. English rule is found to be the most suitable form of government by which the spoliation can be protected, and an English army the most pliant tool with which to execute judicial murder when the fears of the propertied classes demand it. The socialist who would destroy, root, and branch the whole brutally materialistic system of civilization, which, like the English language we have adopted as our own, is, I hold, a far more deadly foe to English rule and tutelage than the superficial thinker who imagines it possible to reconcile Irish freedom with those insidious but disastrous forms of economic subjection, landlord tyranny, capitalist fraud, and unclean usury. Baneful fruits of the Norman conquest, the unholy trinity, of which Strongbow and Diermud Mach Merchada, Norman thief and Irish traitor, were the fitting precursors and apostles. If you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organization of the Socialist Republic, your efforts would be in vain. England would still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. England would still rule you to your ruin, even while your lips offered hypocritical homage at the shrine of that freedom which cause you had betrayed. Nationalism without socialism, without a reorganization of society on the basis of a broader and more developed form of that common property which underlaid the social structure of ancient Erin, is only national recreancy. It would be tantamount to a public declaration that our oppressors had so far succeeded in inoculating us with their perverted conceptions of justice and morality that we had finally decided to accept these conceptions as our own and no longer needed an alien army to force them upon us. As a socialist, I am prepared to do all one man can do to achieve for our motherland her rightful heritage, independence. But if you ask me to abate one jot or tittle of the claims of social justice, in order to conciliate the privileged classes, then I must decline. Such action would be neither honorable nor feasible. Let us never forget that he never reaches heaven who marches thither in the company of the devil. Let us openly proclaim our faith. The logic of events is with us.